Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior corporate leader from the U.S., Gabriela Schuster. Gabriela, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, Gabriela is a DEI advocate, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about DEI. Uh, and she's an executive board member um, and a former Microsoft executive for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the high tech industry. She's a founding sponsor of Women in Cloud and Women in Technology Network. She's a board advisor to Workshare Partners, Artificial Solutions, and Corrent Technology. She's been recognized, awarded, and felicitated globally. And like all of you know, I'm always very partial to authors. She's an author of a book titled Become Allies, a Framework for Change. Gabriela, wow, what an amazing journey you've had. Uh, so let's talk DEI. Um, yeah. Why is diversity, equity, and inclusion becoming so relevant in the high-tech industry now? Well, you know, there's, um, I'll boil it down to three reasons, right? One is that there is a tremendous talent shortage. Mm -hmm. And um, because women make up 50% of the global workforce and mm -hmm. only 25% of the high-tech workforce, mm -hmm. um, the organizations know they have a missed opportunity. So mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out how do they close that gap? Right. Um, the second reason is that the research is pretty clear that organizations that have diverse diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion, which is even more important, right? That's the opportunity to actually flourish the diversity and, and feed and empower the diversity in your organization, mm -hmm. um, have greater profitability and greater innovation. Mm -hmm. And so obviously in high tech, they need that. Mm -hmm. um, and third, you know, there is a lot of talk about the great resignation okay. as a result of COVID, that women are leaving the workforce and particularly in high tech in great numbers. And so organizations are really trying to figure out what they should be doing differently and why. Thank you. So, you know, I was talking to some other very, very senior tech leaders. And one of the factors they also said, exactly what you said about 50% of the workforce, but they also said that getting this work from home in the last two years um, as, as, as something positive, they've brought a lot of women um, young women who may have stopped their careers because of family or raising a child, et cetera, they brought them back. Is that the same experience you have? Um, I think that the flexibility of the last couple of years has been good. I think a lot of it is very dependent on where someone might be in their um, life and in their career journey. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, so yes, if um, I think it's been, good for women who um, either they don't yet have children or their children are kind of in that middle school to mm -hmm. higher age. Mm -hmm. um, for women where their children are like in elementary or younger, mm -hmm. it's been super hard. And so no matter how you slice it, like life is chaotic when mm -hmm. everyone is at home. <laughs> well, I agree with you. <laughs> that, that is true. That is so true. But, you know, uh, Gabriela, the, the whole question of the gender inequality, women empowerment is a challenge all over the world. I'd love to get your perspective on what are some of the key challenges and what can we be, what can be done about it? Well, so again, I think I'll boil it down to maybe three key challenges. Um, there's a lot of um, unconscious bias that's really ingrained in the system. Mm -hmm. um, second, networking in this industry is very difficult for women. And third, um, there's a lot of bro culture. So let me talk about a little bit about each one. Mm -hmm. In the um, unconscious bias, it starts with the hiring process. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unconscious bias in the hiring process. JDs are formulated to pick the best of the best out of the best schools and the smartest mm -hmm. classes and all this. And um, and you lose a lot of diversity when your uh, job description reads like that because women are less likely to apply for a job if they don't feel like they fit 100% mm -hmm. 
of the criteria. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you screen a lot of women out in that, in that whole, just in that very first posting of the job. Um, The the second part of that process is that um, in the high tech industry, there's a legacy of hiring for fit rather than hiring for diversity. And when you hire for fit, you are actually saying, I want to hire people like me. And then you're just screening out diversity. So there's a couple of things that are kind of ingrained in the system and the process. The second thing is networking. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the um, culture of high tech are people who went to school together and then they start up in, they go into a startup together and they bring each other along. And that kind of networking tends to be very male dominated. And that's why the tech industry has tended to continue to be very male dominated. When you look at the legacy of any of the big tech companies, and Mm. then even a lot of the startups, that's still what you see happening. Mm. And, um, and so having a woman being able to break into that Mm. is, um, is difficult. And then COVID has actually put networking for a lot of women puts networking on the bottom of the list, right? right? Um, They're going to work on basic needs before they go out and do additional networking. And you have to be so intentional in a virtual environment Mm. to reach out and network and, and, and keep up connections. Mm. So I think that that's um, made it difficult. And then uh, the third thing is, is this bro culture. Um, And this really became very evident to me Um, I um, was doing a lot of work with our employee resource group for our transgender community. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, what a gift it was to talk to a lot of these individuals who have Mm -hmm. worked in the same place as both a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And they can tell you what that bro culture really feels like and that it is alive and well and kicking. And so, um, you know, those, those kinds of microaggressions are things mm-hmm. that we have to bring back into the awareness so that we can help people understand why that creates a non-inclusive environment. So, you know, uh, you spoke about the job descriptions being almost written to uh, maybe favor is the wrong word, but in a manner that you know, the person who's writing it uh, tends to say that, okay, maybe I'll get this kind of a profile. How does one start to change this mindset? Well, you know, we had started some of this work at Microsoft. The way um, you do that is you take a look at every single job description before you post it. And you say, of these things, how many of these things are nice to have? And how Mm -hmm. many of these things are really required? And you whittle and whittle and whittle back the job description to those things that are absolutely required. Mm -hmm. And then you can put language in Mm -hmm. about things that are nice to have. Mm -hmm. um, But it tends to be less intimidating to um, diverse populations that might be reading that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Uh, based on the changes you have made, are you beginning to see a change in the applicants? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, there's a number of changes that we made though. One is that um, in my team, I required every one of the hiring managers to um, have at least 50% of the candidates be external Mm -hmm. to Microsoft, right? Because there's a lot of that inbreeding where you hire a lot of people from inside the company Mm -hmm. and then you don't ever address your diversity challenge that way. Yes. Um, so that one thing was external um, applicants, and then they couldn't start the process until they had um, at least three diverse candidates mm-hmm. in the pool. Um, and so, um, you know, we started training with all of our hiring managers mm-hmm. on how do you network within diverse communities so that you already have a slate you're already mentoring people who might be qualified candidates and you can encourage them to apply so that your maybe um, cycle of hiring is not so long. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, really encouraging people not to hire for expediency, which tends to, they tend to go with people they know, um, but to um, make sure that they were actually hiring the, um, the, the best candidate out of their pool based on that criteria. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. 
So, you know, Microsoft as an organization is a cauldron of multiple cultures from multiple countries. You probably employ someone from every country in the world. Yes. I'd love to get your perspective, Gabriela, on how does culture impact diversity and uh, equity from the perspective of the candidate? Oh, well, so there's, there's, you mean like the culture of the country? Correct. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it, it is the definition of diversity mm. changes mm. in every country, okay. right? Mm. So um, in many countries, it is why we focus a lot on gender diversity, mm. because in many countries, that's the only thing that mm. they really differentiate around, mm. right? Um, but then you have other countries like the UK, where they have like nine different definitions of um, of dif- diversity. I've, I've found them to be the most um, comprehensive, mm-hmm. and I love that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and um, and so so part of it is is that part of it is that um, there are still you know there are countries where um, women have always had um, more of an equal footing. Um, in, in like many of the Nordic countries where it was, it was fairly equal between men and women. Um, whereas you have, um, uh, you know, a lot of countries where um, it's definitely um, still much more archaic in the perspective of women working at all. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think those, um, those, those mm. differences really play a big role. Incredible. And um society in a lot of these countries also plays a very significant role. I mean, there are parts of India, for example, where even today, um, women are encouraged not to work, but to stay at home. And these are qualified uh, women. I mean, you know, they've got educated, etc. I'd love to get your perspective on what can society do to change this imbalance in uh, diversity? Well, um, well, well, one thing that just starts to drive that is the economics, mm-hmm. right? Uh, yeah. um, so when the economics push you, that's where everybody goes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when there's such a talent shortage, mm-hmm. when the only way that you're going to get qualified talent is if you bring women into the workforce and you, and you hire them and you train them and you promote mm-hmm. them, um, that is definitely something that all around the world is the okay. same, will change that dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um so that's one thing. But I, the other is really, um, you know, um, having the right public policy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you see this in many countries across Europe and, and even some change within the EU, mm-hmm. some of the states within the US with California really driving mm-hmm. a lot of that change in the forefront um, mm-hmm. of requiring women on the board of directors, um, of requiring organizations to report their diversity figures mm-hmm. um, of requiring organizations to report their pay equity. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of public policy mm-hmm. will help us to drive transparency. Mm-hmm. Um, that transparency will enable us to aggregate a lot of that data, mm-hmm. get to a common language in mm-hmm. how we look at the data and then start to assess where our challenges really are. Mm-hmm. In many cases, because we don't have consistent taxonomy around diversity mm-hmm. and we don't have public reporting in like 99% of countries um, or states, right. that, um, right. then, you know, we um, we get a very skewed view and we don't really know by industry, by role, mm-hmm. by, you know, where are the issues? Is it in um, training, it, early education? Is it in retention, promotion? You know, where are the challenges mm-hmm. that we're mm-hmm. facing? Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So, you know, when I was reading about you, um, it was interesting to me, you know, you worked with a lot of women um, and of course uh, everyone else. I'd love to get your view on what are some of the self-limiting beliefs you have worked with and what have been some of the successes you have seen? Self-limiting beliefs. That is, um, so some of the self-limiting beliefs are um, women are um, kind of raised um, not to, um, to be, to have, to be humble, Mm -hmm. not to toot their own horn. Mm -hmm. Um, to be um, 
modest, mm -hmm. not to, um, not to take too much risk. Mm -hmm. They're socialized not to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and to, and, and then, you know, and then this whole, um, element of, you know, perfectionism needing to, um, be, be able to check all of the boxes before mm. you go forward or, um, or even the belief, um, the mistaken belief that life is a meritocracy. And if mm -hmm. you just work working really hard, mm. eventually your good work will be noticed. Mm. Um, and all of those things I think lead to, um, women holding themselves back because mm. they buy into those, um, norms. Mm. Um, thank you. So uh, there's another aspect, uh, which again, I believe has a significant impact on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, is uh, one's own religious beliefs. Um, how have you seen this being overcome? So, I, I mean, I... I don't know that I've, I've seen people held back as much and, and it could be just, you know, that's a very personal thing and it doesn't, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily come up a lot, but sure. um, you know, I, I, I do, um, I do think it's comes back to that same thing. It, it's about uh, your culture, right? Religion in a lot of ways is your culture. It's the way that you're raised. Mm -hmm. It's the things you believe in. Um, uh, women need to be valued. They need to be valued as much as men. Um, you know, I mean, even in, in India, I think one of the things that I have found fascinating is that education is valued above all else. And women are sent forth to get educated and get just as educated as men. But Absolutely. then when it comes to actually working, they're mm. not encouraged to, to, to do anything with that. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> right? Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, I think the, the role that the thing we have to do is not to change religion or change the values behind mm -hmm. it, but to recognize that there's also that same kind of unconscious bias and mm -hmm. that bro culture mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily the religion itself. It's, it's dictated by the people who are leading that religion, which tend to be the men. Correct. Correct. Well said. So uh, one more question on uh, DEI before I move to your book. Uh, this is now the age of the millennials and the Gen Zs. And I'm sure you've got thousands of millennials and Gen Zs working for you uh, in, in your organization. What is your um, impression of how they are reacting to diversity, equity, inclusion as compared to an an older generation? Well, I love this generation. Mm. I love this generation because at least in the US, so I, I can't really speak to it very mm. broadly. Um, my perspective is pretty much a US centric mm. on this part. Um, but this generation um, has been raised to be much more um, accepting mm -hmm. in a more inclusive environment. There have been um, across the U.S. a number of programs around anti-bullying because bullying was such has become such a big issue. Okay. Um, and that anti-bullying training is what allyship is all about. Mm. And so this generation was raised um, in many cases to um, to not accept the norm mm -hmm. and um, and to embrace diversity and differences mm -hmm. and um, to um, be more their authentic selves mm -hmm. than I think previous generations. I, and what are your thoughts on that? No, no, I agree with you completely. I mean, uh, you know, I have two sons, uh, both work for large American companies, one in Singapore, one in the US. And the way they think about uh, the way, you know, women and inclusion must happen is something that I have never seen before in India. So I'm in complete agreement with what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Gabriela, now coming, coming to the, the next segment of our conversation, it's your book, yeah. uh, Become Allies, a Framework for Change. Let me start by asking you, is this available on Amazon and other platforms? Um, it's available for free on my website. So oh, okay. all you have to do is go to GabriellaSchuster.com and you can download the ebook. Terrific. So tell me a little bit about uh, your book and the hypothesis uh, on in it. 
Well, so it, there's two sections. Mm -hmm. um, the first section is about the diversity. So how do you create greater diversity mm -hmm. in your organization? And what's the value of doing that? Mm -hmm. And that's really what I focused my um, become framework around, which is, mm -hmm. you know, how do you connect? How do you intentionally go out and network into communities that are not your own? Mm -hmm. Right. So, for instance, um, when I went out to network within the transgender community to learn mm -hmm. more, to mm -hmm. um, mentor more individuals who had a different background, different belief system than my own. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it is about when you do that you start to build out your network. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned before, you start to get to know a whole different group of people than mm -hmm. those that you would naturally tend to network with. If you walked into a room, you tend mm -hmm. to gravitate towards people who look like you. Mm -hmm. um, instead, you push yourself to go to the group that looks least like you mm -hmm. or is acting least like you would and learn more. Um, and so that's connecting creating those connections. Mm. Um, I hear from a lot of CEOs, um, they say, well, I would hire more women, but um, we they're not, I just don't know where they are. And you're mm. like, well, you need to intentionally go out and find them. You need to start networking in those communities where they are. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is about outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so that is what we were talking about before in terms mm. of your recruiting and hiring process and mm. how you might modify that process so that it is more welcoming mm. to, um, to women. Mm. Um, and then the third step in that is mentorship. Mm -hmm. So as you start to um, nurture these relationships and create new connections, mm -hmm. um, offering yourself up as a mentor, um, not to those people who are most likely like you, but to those people who are least like you. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you find you get a tremendous reverse mentorship relationship where you learn as much from them as they're learning from you um, and you're offering your experience. Um, and then the last um, element of that is empowerment mm -hmm. and empowering someone is how you create an inclusive environment. Mm -hmm. When you empower somebody, you um, enable them to be their authentic self. You mm -hmm. welcome them in all of their differences and you value them for their differences. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that led me to the second part of my framework, which is allyship. Um, and empowering individuals in your organization is about creating allies. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a situation like I was in for most of my career, mm -hmm. where I was like the only woman in the room, mm -hmm. um, if I'm there without any allies, it's really lonely. Correct. And I have a hard time breaking through. But if I have just one ally in that room, mm -hmm. um, then it, it changes the dynamic completely. True, true, true. Right? And so, um, so in the in the ebook, I explain that there are really six actions that men can take mm. to be allies to adjust their behavior. Now, they they sound easy, but they're not easy, mm. right? Um, but um, I I, I make it, I try to make it easy for you to remember. So mm. you take the word allies, and it's about being an advocate, listening, lifting up those around you, including them. So always looking around to say, is the right, are the right people here in this conversation? Yeah. Um, elevating them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, giving them an opportunity to be more visible, to give them visible projects, to put them out front, and then sponsoring them, um, sponsoring them into new opportunities, new roles, new companies. Wow. Fascinating. Gabriela, on that note, um, thank you so much for speaking to me. Uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for talking to me at such length about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, I've learned so many new things from you today. And uh, thank you for talking to me about your book. And I just want to repeat what you just said, that the book is available to be downloaded free from GabriellaSchuster.com. Gav Gabriella spelled with a V, not a B. Um, so thank you again and good luck. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. 
do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.